Hi everyone, and welcome to this uh, webinar dedicated to uh, continuous testing with a test. So during this uh, one hour session, we'll share with you a framework to test your software, your features continuously uh, from ID to production using the hip test platform. So here are um, the three speakers. I am Laurent, uh, one of the co-founder of hip test and I'm leading the the product here, I will so run this session uh, together with uh, Vincent, who is part of the dev team, senior developer and the father of FIPTest Publisher that you will see during the demo and who is used for um, test automation. And we are also very happy to welcome a, a guest speaker, uh, Ryan, uh, who is um, VP of product uh, at SmartBear. And that leads me to um, the next slide, which is, uh, a very exciting news that we shared um, uh, with you and, and the market two weeks ago. So HipTest has joined uh, the SmartBear family. Uh, the addition of uh, HipTest to the SmartBear portfolio makes um, a very uh, compelling offering now, a test offering for DevOps companies with uh, the ability to, uh, um, to collaborate. So that's the HipTest piece, collaborate continuously uh, when testing uh, features from ID to production, the ability to uh, automate uh, U-Test, UBDD scenario, that's part of um, uh, the test left uh, product, ability to automate U-Test with test complete, ability to run the Selenium test um, in using uh, cross-brother testing. So by the way, you will see uh, this uh, integration live today. So hip test and, and cross-brother testing. So there are many uh, exciting new uh, scenarios and uh, synergies that uh, we'll, we are working on. And stay tuned, there will be many great things uh, for, uh, for the future. So uh, this is the agenda of this webinar. I will first start by a brief introduction of uh, testing in DevOps. What does it mean? What's the, the biggest opportunity that we, we do see at Tip test and uh, for this webinar, I will uh, sometimes use our own examples as, as we are a DevOps team using behavior-driven development, deploying continuously in, in production. But uh, we have shared and refined the, the framework we are presenting today with all of our community that now counts more than 20, uh, uh, 25,000 uh, users. So first, I will start uh, by by introducing uh, testing in DevOps, and then we'll share with you this four steps process, uh, starting by uh, testing the ID. Why that, that's the shift left part. Uh, how and why should we uh, start by testing the ID? Uh, step two, uh, testing the code once we've done the implementation. Step three, uh, once the feature has been deployed or the release has been done and the feature is in the hands of real users, how can we continue uh, to test in production, and step four, how can we uh, iterate on that? So let's start uh, by um, this introduction, testing in DevOps. And usually when we ask the question, what's the biggest opportunity as a DevOps teams that you have uh, regarding testing? Uh, so moving from, let's say, when, when you move from one release every month, every two weeks to a couple of releases a day, uh, the way you uh, handle testing change uh, completely. What's the biggest opportunity? Usually people say speeds. We, we go much faster. We, have, uh, we do much more um, uh, deployment. Uh, so the deployment frequency, the, the development speed. But that's uh, from a testing point of view. Um, it's not the, the speed of development or speed of deployment. It's um, the speed of learning. When we have, <coughs> um, uh, when we do continuous deployment, when we have the opportunity to, to do multiple releases a day, it means we have the opportunity to get feedback from the users or to get feedback from a small uh, feature increment uh, uh, very, very uh, quickly. That's the biggest value that we see as uh, product guys or uh, entrepreneurs. Uh, when using this uh, this DevOps approach. So basically the idea is, is to go as quickly as possible through this uh, loop, uh, starting from the ID. So let's define the ID. Then let's create, uh, let's code and create a first prototype. 
let's test this prototype, uh, see how the users uh, use the feature, consume the, the, the feature, and based on data and, and users feedback, let's learn uh, from, from that experiment and, and let's uh, iterate. And basically, uh, when you look at the most successful companies in the world, either it's Facebook, Google, or any other, that the, the speed of learning is, uh, is key. So the ability to go very quickly through uh, this, um, uh, this feedback loop. And the, for, the, for the testing part, that can be, uh, of course, very, very challenging. So that, that's the framework that we'll share um, with you today. And basically, uh, when it comes to test in such an environment, there are uh, four questions that we, um, we ask ourselves uh, when working on a new feature. So the first one is, uh, which value do we want to deliver? And, and we have this discussion uh, with all the team members, product owners, testers, developers, uh, the marketing, before writing a single line of code. We should be all on the same page and we should be clear on why do we do this feature? What's the value? The second uh, question that we answer is, after the implementation, is the feature is the uh, feature implementation, so is the code aligned with, uh, with that value? So that's the second uh, question and the second um, testing step. The third one is uh, we have deployed the feature in production because uh, the great news is that the dev process doesn't stop after the CI. The most important part comes when the, the users uh, start to play with the feature or with, with the application. So does this feature have a real impact uh, on the user as expected. So we have to measure that. That's part of the uh, testing activity. And the last one, uh, which is also very important, is uh, as we continue to build a product and add more and more features, we need to make sure that uh, not only after the deployment of the feature, but one month later, six months, one year, two years, and so on, the feature is still valuable, still still have a, a great impact on the on the user. So we need to continuously uh, monitor that. So that's the four steps we're going to share with you today uh, that redefine the way uh, we do uh, testing in modern software development. So first step, uh, let's dig into uh, testing the idea. So basically here, uh, as I said, the objective is to answer two questions. The first one is why? So why as a manager or product, uh, product owner, why should we invest uh, money on developing this feature? Um, what's the value of this feature for the end users? And, and we should better be clear on this before starting implementation. And when I say we, I include, once again, tester, developers, so all the, the, the project uh, stakeholders. It's not just a business decision. Everyone should be aligned uh, uh, on that. So in order to create this alignment, we can use uh, interesting tools like Personae. So it helps to, this proxy helps to create uh, intimacy between the end users. So you may have different segments and, uh, and the, the rest of the team. Uh, and usually what we do during this uh, session, when we discuss the, the new feature to be uh, developed, we um, typically define some business metrics. What are the business metrics assumptions that we make and the metrics related to this feature? So that once the feature will be in production, we'll be able to measure and see if to track these metrics and see if the impact is the one uh, we were expecting. So based on this, and if you have the opportunity on a, um, a regular basis to discuss with your customers, uh, with the, the end users, that's, uh, that's even better. But based on that, the idea is to um, have a clear understanding of the why of the feature. For the, the last point, which is uh, defining the behavior of the feature. So here again, not only we want to make, uh, we want it to be clear uh, the value, the, the, what are the business assumptions, but we should also make it very clear before starting uh, to write a single line of code, what should be the, the behavior of the feature. So here we answer the what. Uh, and the, one of the, the great approach to uh, answer these questions is to use BDD, so behavior-driven development. That's um, 
so that's a great way. Um, so thank you. The next slide. That's a, a great way to uh, uh, drive the conversation between uh, product owners, developers, uh, uh, testers, um, creating a shared understanding of the feature based on uh, examples. So we'll see that uh, during the demo in, in a couple of minutes. Uh, these examples that defines that describe the different use cases uh, should be um, um, designed using a consistent business terminology. So basically, this business terminology is the shared language used by the team, and it helps to to bridge the gap between business users or the business teams and and technology teams. And and this is um, a very key point because um, when you want to uh, accelerate uh, through the cycles, collaboration becomes um, a real um, challenge. Uh, so you can't afford to have silos, and and you need to make sure that everyone speaks the same language. BDD uh, and the use of this um, uh, common business terminology is definitely uh, one of the the great game changer uh, that we've seen among um, DevOps teams or agile teams that started to adopt the shift left. Uh, once we have defined these examples and we are all on the same page regarding the behavior of the feature, we can use these examples to drive development. So at this point, when uh, the dev team kicks in, not only we are clear on the business, the business expectations that we have for the feature, but we are also very clear and align on what are the different use cases and the behaviors for, for this feature. And the last point, uh, the, the, one of the great outcome of BDD is that um, once you, you, you acceptance tests, your examples are automated, they become a living documentation. And here again, we'll see that during the, the demo. So no need to, uh, no need to explain it uh, <laughs> in a more detailed way right now. Uh, just before uh, doing the demo, starting with the demo, I uh, just wanted to share with you the, the testing process that we have at TipTest. So uh, once again, the context here is we are a DevOps team. Uh, we deploy between five to 10 times a day in production, <clears throat> but it's small increments. So unfortunately for me, it doesn't mean we deploy five to 10 new features uh, a day. I would love that, but it's not, uh, it's not the case. Uh, and, and this is the, um, the process and, and the tools uh, that we use regarding uh, collaboration and uh, uh, acceptance uh, testing and BDD. So to manage our uh, features and, and user story backlog, we use uh, Trello. Uh, and just keep in mind that uh, IPTest integrate with uh, Trello, with Jira, uh, any web-based uh, project management tool, so it can be Rally and so on. Um, so we use that to, uh, to manage the backlog uh, before starting implementation of a feature or user story. We have this free Amigo session where we have the product owner, myself, the marketing, uh, one developer and, and, and one tester. And we do make sure that uh, we, we have a shared understanding of the feature, uh, at the business expectations, uh, uh, so what are the business assumptions and also for the, the behavior of the feature. For that, we use IPTest to capture the different uh, BDD scenarios for, for this feature. And step three, we use these BDD scenarios to drive development as they are all automated. And we'll see also how the automation process works uh, during the, the demo. So it's integrated at IPTest with our continuous integration, continuous deployment pipeline. We, we use Shippable for that. So all the, um, the BDD scenarios are executed um, uh, automatically. And when they all pass, the um, software uh, is deployed in, in uh, production. And in production, we can do some exploratory testing. And of course, uh, monitor uh, on a uh, continuous, we can, and we monitor continuously uh, the usage of, uh, of this feature, which is part of the feedback loop I mentioned earlier. So, at the, the ideation level, the different ways, uh, practices that can be useful to uh, test the ID, uh, behavior-driven development is definitely uh, a very um, important one. 
So let's switch to the demo, Vincent. Okay, thanks, Lauren. So uh, for this demo, I'm going to use iptest, obviously. And uh, as a system to uh, describe, I'm using a, a coffee machine. So not the classical filter coffee machine, uh, automated espresso coffee machine, the kind of coffee machine that makes really great coffee, but complains half of the time because it's missing water, it's missing bean, uh, you need to descale it, things like that. You know how it works if you got uh, this kind of machine at home or at work. Uh, but anyway, that makes uh, lots of different uh, features uh, to define and to test. Just a quick word about uh, this project. It's uh, one of the example projects you can regenerate uh, in IPTEST if you want to play with it. And there is some implementation done in uh, various languages. So uh, what I'm going to show you right now is uh, how you handle uh, really the ideation phase uh, in IPTEST. So how you will uh, write your different example, your different feature. As Lauren mentioned, uh, BDD is mainly about uh, collaboration. So it's lots and lots of discussion before uh, really writing the, the scenarios, the example. Obviously, for the uh, ease of the understanding of this webinar, we will not do the discussion, but we'll focus on how you can organize and structure your project in IPTEST. So first, let's have a look at how you can organize them. One of the Good practice is to uh, have one folder in IP, in IP test that will describe each feature of your application. So here uh, we are testing an uh, a coffee machine. So obviously, uh, one of the most expected feature from it would be to, to serve coffee, but it has also a different feature like uh, translating the different messages. As I mentioned, uh, displaying lots of errors when all you want to get is a coffee. And here, what you can see is that you can refine, uh, let's say, big feature into sub features. Uh, like here, you've got three kind of messages uh, depending on, on what needs to be done uh, before getting your coffee. What you may have seen uh, while I was uh, going from one feature to another is that each of them has a description using uh, some keywords in order to, as a I can, uh, those descriptions are really helpful because it keeps uh, the benefits in mind. So what we have here is uh, typically a person I. So in this project, all the person I's are coffee lover, surprisingly. Uh, there is uh, some action that this uh, person can do, uh, like getting coffee, and what is the benefit for him or for her? And in that case, uh, at least that's my case, enjoying the rest of the day after a good cup of coffee. Uh, it's really important to have those uh, description for each feature. Uh, for example, as a developer, it's really helpful for me to know, okay, I'm developing uh, something, what uh, type of user is going to uh, use it and what will be uh, the benefits we'll be able to get. And uh, this really drives uh, the development. Then each feature will be uh, refined uh, with one or multiple examples. So this one, we just have uh, one single example or scenario. But of course, it's possible to have uh, three, five, ten different examples, depending on the size of the feature. So let's have a look at uh, this scenario. First thing we can notice uh, on this one and all the other ones in this project is the use of uh, the Gherkin keywords given when then. Those keywords are really helpful because they are going to help you structure your scenarios. The given part will give the context in which the scenario takes place. The when part will describe the action or actions uh, that are performed. And the when part will uh, list the different expectations, like here, getting a coffee. Second thing uh, we can notice here is the use of the declarative style. To make it uh, simple, there's two ways to write your scenarios, declarative and imperative. The declarative style will describe <coughs> what is done uh, during a step. The imperative style will describe how it's done. To make it uh, clearer, if we take a look at the second one, when I take a coffee, I just describe what I do. If I was using an imperative style, I would have something like, okay, I put uh, one coffee cup uh, below the output and I press on this specific button on the coffee machine and things like that. Those tests can have uh, the use, 
But uh, the main problem with this kind of writing is that it doesn't help understand really getting the, uh, the behavior of the future. It's really too technical. It will be hard uh, to have everyone understanding how the project, uh, what the feature does if you start going too much in the detail. One thing to remember, uh, those behavior uh, BDD example are supposed to uh, be able to be used as a living documentation. So anyone should be able to understand what's, uh, what the feature does. And you don't want to go to the technical details, especially when you start sharing with less technical people. What you want to do is capture the intent of the feature. And that's why uh, the declarative style is really important. Last thing uh, we can see on this scenario, and once again, all the other one, is that it's using action words. So action words are uh, really one of the key features of HipTest. Uh, to explain it briefly, uh, it's reusable steps that you can share across multiple scenarios. You can see that as little bricks that will help you uh, create your different scenarios. They have multiple advantages. The first one, it's uh, the action word that will help you get this common business terminology because uh, they will be proposed when you are uh, typing a scenario. Uh, the action word, you'll have the possibility to reuse them across multiple scenarios, so have this consistent business terminology. One interest of this common business terminology is that, for example, if you are a newcomer in the company and the project has been started, let's say, two or three years ago, it will be way easier for you to understand what the product does uh, if you have always the same sentences uh, used across multiple uh, multiple scenarios. The thing is that uh, there are single points of maintenance in it test. That means that if I modify an action word, for example, I could say I want to rename this one and say it has been started instead of is started. I can say simply, okay, I want to rename this action word everywhere. So what it's go what's going to happen is that the 10, 15, 100 scenarios, not in this project, of course, using this action word will be updated in one second. And that's really uh, helpful when it comes to uh, maintaining your project, because this way you'll have the possibility, for example, if one action word is, uh, is badly written, you won't have to go in 15, 100 different scenarios to update it. You can simply uh, update it as one. So that's really uh, the idea of how you can uh, yeah, structure your project in a test and describe uh, the different examples. And once you've got uh, those examples, uh, you've finished uh, the first part of the, the process, so testing the idea. So now uh, everyone knows what the feature that has to be done is supposed to do. Uh, everyone is aligned, so it's time for the dev team to kick in and start uh, implementing uh, this feature. Mm -hmm. So ju just keep in mind here that uh, no single line of code has been written yet. And uh, uh, in terms of, uh, let's say, process, the, the discussions that happens uh, here to test the ID for, um, let's say, a complex feature or medium feature uh, typically takes a half an hour. And for a more complex feature, it can be a, an hour or so. So we, we don't uh, talk about days of discussions mm -hmm. uh, it's it's very uh, it's very quick and, and efficient yeah straight to the point <laughs> most of the time so let's see what the dev team can do now so as i said we are all have this uh, shared understanding now of the feature and as a developer uh at least as the as a dev team the first thing we are going to do is not uh, fully develop the feature but select uh a set, a subset of the example to get the first increment uh, of this feature. Once again, one thing we want and one thing that drives us is the feedbacks uh, from the customers and also from the, the system as we'll see later on. So it's, it's better sometimes to uh, give just a sub part of the feature, uh, have some beta tester giving feedback so we can directly align and see uh, what's needed to be done. I won't go in the technical details on uh, how we can uh, implement this feature because it's going to change uh, in any team. But yeah, so let's just imagine we uh, have implemented 
three example on the 10 uh, different scenario describing the feature. So the dev team is going to uh, do the code for that, automate uh, the three scenarios so they will be uh, integrated in the CI CD pipeline and this is going to go uh, to production. But before uh, having a look to how it goes to production, I'm just going to talk a bit about uh, the way we automate a tip test. As you've seen in the, the slide, Lauren talked uh, about the testing process at the test. Uh, you saw we, we rely heavily on uh, CI CD. And here at tip test, 100% of the scenarios are automated. And one thing to note automation is not a, a way to cut costs, it can be expensive, it's not uh, always magical, and uh, it can take time uh, to get the automation done and to get it done right. But the real huge benefit you can get with automation is that uh, you're going to get this really quick feedback loop. And once again, even if everything is automated here, that doesn't mean we don't uh, use manual testing. You saw it in the, in the previous slide, we have some exploratory testing. But the thing is, the manual testing does not block a deployment. We may have to revert our code, obviously, that can happen, uh, and get back to the previous version because we found something uh, with exploratory testing that was not uh, found by the automated test. But uh, it's only the automated test that will say, okay, does this go to production or does it not? And that's how we get this really quick feedback loop. Just to give an idea of uh, how the tests are structured here at tip test. Uh, so you may recognize the classical Martin Fowler uh, pyramid of tests. So on top, you've got the UI end-to-end -end test. They are really expensive uh, to write and you also need uh, uh, lots of um, popular power to, to get them running. They are usually slow. And on the other hand, you've got the, the unit test. They are really cheap because uh, for most agile team, at least, uh, this is considered as part of the development, especially with TDD, and they are really fast uh, to run. And in the middle, you have the service or integration test, uh, generally testing uh, integration of different modules. They are not that cheap, but not that expensive, and uh, not that slow, but not that fast either. So here at test, we got about 500 uh, BDD tests. So, uh, it's really the UI ones. Uh, they are really high level. Uh, they are simulating the browser action. And uh, the service and unit test, uh, altogether, it's about uh, 5,000 tests. So 4,000 for the backend uh, written with RSpec, and 1,200 uh, in JavaScript for the front end part. So now what I'm going to show you is how you can uh, start the automation with a test. Uh, it's just going to be a, an overview, a really quick one. Uh, and uh, if you're more interested in that, we also have a webinar dedicated uh, really to the, the automation. So when we want to automate our tests uh, from a test, what we are going to use is a test publisher. And you can have a look to the cloud version of this tool uh, in this automation page. One thing to note about IPTest Publisher, it's an open source tool. Uh, here it's the cloud version, but it can also be installed locally uh, on the computer. It works on Windows, Linux, and Mac OS X. And the role of IPTest Publisher is to translate folders, scenarios, action word uh, to code in any of the languages uh, we can see here. So I'm going to show uh, the generated code with JUnit uh, just to give you an idea of uh, how this is generated. So in the folder, uh, we can find four different files, uh, one config file, uh, so you can reuse uh, the installed version of Hiptest Publisher. It's already uh, pointing to your, to your project. But what we are really interested in will be, uh, not now, uh, will be the, the code uh, that can be generated. So. Uh, here, we have a look to the, the generated test, so you can recognize the different sentences. And if you're a bit familiar uh, with coding, what you may see is that um, all the, the tests are only made of uh, call to different functions. And those functions, as you can see, are the action word. What that means, and uh, that's really interesting, is that 
this test file is a file that you never uh, modify manually. It's something that's uh, auto-generated, and you can regenerate it as much as you want uh, to match uh, the data you've updated in test. The only file you will uh, manually modify, in fact, is uh, the list of action words. So, as I said previously, an action word in IPTEST is a single point of maintenance in your project. So if you modify uh, <clears throat> your action word, you can impact 10 hundred of uh, scenarios in one second. But one other benefit of those action words for the automation part is that they are also single points of implementation. So the more you reuse an action word, the less work you've got to do. And that's something really nice. So each action word will become here, a function in Java, uh, and that's where the automation team will kick in and they will uh, start the implementation. So here you are uh, really free on uh, the way you implement them. Uh, you can use Selenium to test a website, as we are going to see uh, just in a few minutes with uh, Ryan. Uh, you can use APM to test a mobile app. You can use uh, HTTP commands when you want to uh, test an API. It's completely up to you. Uh, one thing I wanted to mention about the, the single point of, uh, of automation, uh, one of our customers has been uh, kind enough to, to share some uh, data with us. Uh, it's uh, partly on when they were testing the um, ticketing system for the city of Helsinki, and uh, they had 3,000 scenarios, uh, a bit more than 3,000 if I recall correctly, and all of them were written using only 1,700 action words. So basically what that means is that they had 1,700 different uh, functions to implement to uh, be able to run 3,000 tests. So that's something that's uh, really impressive. And that's why uh, it's really important to spend time in the test project to refactor, to ensure you don't have uh, action word duplication, uh, it just provides some tool to help you uh, remove the duplication. And uh, the more you rely on the action word, the more you have this consistent business terminology uh, you get from BDD, uh, the less work you have to do when you want to uh, start the automation. And now I'm going to give the word uh, to Ryan so we can have a look to uh, how, the, how we can integrate if this publish, uh, uh, it test generated code uh, with uh, code testing. testing. Sorry, I'm finding my words there. Make presenter, that's better. So Ryan, it's up to you. Great. Thank you, uh, Vincent. So where we'd like to pick up here is uh, we're looking at uh, the hip test project here that Vincent was taking us through the coffee machine example. Uh, we can see the 14 scenarios, the action words, and we have this continuous integration uh, uh, configured for our project. And we can see the recent history uh, of that uh, test run. So let's look at the execution history uh, for this CI configuration. We can see the last several times that we've executed uh, this CI uh, job for different builds. Uh, we have a failure. So, you know, we initially had 15 uh, test scenarios defined. We added a 16th scenario and that one is failing. And if we drill down into the details here, we can see that that is within our internationalization uh, scenario where we're testing the coffee machines language capabilities. Uh, you can see we added a scenario for German language support. But of course, in this case, the application we're testing uh, does not yet work uh, for the German language. So we can click on that test and we get the detailed log uh, of that Selenium test failure that occurred. So it gives us the details of not being able to find the element with the parameter for the German language support. So the way that we've executed this continuous integration uh, is using the cross-browser testing platform. So one thing to note about cross-browser testing is it provides uh, a platform for us to execute our Selenium automation across over 1,500 different uh, desktop and mobile browser uh, combinations at different resolutions and iOS, Android, uh, desktop, Mac OS. And it supports uh, many of the same uh, open source uh, and, and frameworks that HipTest supports. So you can export your tests using the HipTest publisher. 
and those frameworks can then be used to execute those tests using the cross-browser testing platform. If we look in the cross-browser testing platform in the automation area, uh, we're looking here at the results of those tests being run recently. Uh, and I've got a few different um, iterations here that have been run. Uh, one from uh, yesterday where all the tests were passing. And then today when I introduced this new scenario, uh, one of the tests had started to fail. So we can see details here of which of those tests have failed. The interesting thing about cross-browser testing uh, is that it also gives us uh, a lot of detail around uh, the specific um, details around that, that test execution. So we can see here uh, the command history uh, when that particular test, in this case, the water test, uh, was being executed. Uh, we've got a screenshot history that's here, so we can see a screenshot that's automatically taken at each step uh, of the test. And we've got this recorded video um, which shows us uh, the actual test being executed. So from a debug perspective, when you've got a test failure, provides a lot of the information you need to figure out exactly where that test uh, had failed. So we've got video, we've got screenshots, uh, we even got network traffic that shows us exactly what uh, is being exchanged between uh, the client browser um, you know, at, at each point in time. So a lot of rich information to help you um, not just execute your Selenium tests across different configurations, run those tests at scale and parallel, but a lot of interesting uh, debug information. Uh, if I expand this tab here, you can see um, I have a cross-browser testing plan that allows me to run up to 150 uh, Selenium tests in parallel. I'm currently running one. Uh, if I execute my uh, continuous integration build again, it's gonna fetch the latest uh, auto-generated test from hip test, uh, compile them, and then of course execute that test uh, on the cross-browser testing platform. So you see I'm running uh, no tests in parallel currently, and then as soon as that test connects and runs, now I'm running multiple tests in parallel. So again, it's another way to accelerate and speed up your automation by running uh, mm. tests concurrently. Uh, and that's really a way that you can combine cross-browser testing and hip test in this whole continuous testing workflow to speed up and automate uh, your testing. Thanks, uh, Ryan, for, for this demo. And definitely uh, uh, being able to shorten the feedback loop and accelerate the process is what we uh, are, are really uh, looking at. So I'm just going to take uh, the wall back. Here it is. So um, at the end of um, uh, this process, so we, we first started by testing the ID uh, using uh, um, behavior driven development. We have uh, now um, tested the implementation. So using uh, hip test, hip test publisher, we've been able to execute uh, all the tests at scale in parallel with uh, cross browser testing. Now uh, that all the tests pass and, and we feel comfortable with, the, um, with this uh, new build, we're going to deploy it uh, in production. So as a, as a product guy, that's the most interesting part for me. So now we're going to really uh, deliver the, the value to the end user. I, at least this is what we are uh, uh, looking for. So uh, we're going to uh, roll out the feature. And, and when rolling out new features at Hip test, um, we, we have two different approaches. The first one is we make it available to all the users. And the second one is maybe using uh, for um, uh, bigger features that can have an impact on usage performance uh, uh, on, the, on the platform. We do a progressive rollout. And uh, so it can be based on the segment of users, the one that use test automation or that do manual testing, the one that use behavior driven development. It can be based on, on geos. But here, basically, the idea is to learn progressively uh, uh, from these uh, different deployments. So um, the feature is available and is in the end of real users. The, the, the first thing that is um, uh, very important for all the team is to make sure that uh, we continue to have, of course, the platform available and with a great user experience. So what we need to make sure is the new feature or the new deployment that has been done uh, doesn't have a bad impact on the user experience. And 
that's where um, over the years, moving from uh, one release every three months to a couple of deployments a day in production, I've seen the change in, uh, uh, in terms of priorities between correctness and availability. Basically, when you have uh, one release every quarter or even let's say one release a month, uh, uh, you need to make sure that uh, the feature uh, works exactly in all the different uh, use cases as expected because the next release uh, you you will have will be in one month or three months when you deploy continuously in production uh, what's more important than let's say maybe a bug is uh, the fact that the platform becomes no more available for all the for all the the, the users and because at hip test as i said we have thousands of uh, users that uh, rely on hip test on a daily basis to do they they uh, they work we need to make sure that the platform is available so it doesn't mean correctness is not important it just means that we value more the availability than uh, the the correctness and if we have some let's say bug or issues with a new feature we'll be able to deploy very quickly a um, uh, fix for, for for that so that means uh, that um, we have to monitor uh, continuously um, the application performance and for this we use a couple of tools like AppSignal, Scalingo, Logmatic, uh, Datadog and there are many others that are used by uh, the DevOps teams in our community, the ones that uh, that use ZipTest. Uh, AlertSight also, uh, uh, which is a, a product from SmartBear, uh, can be very uh, useful to make sure that the, the application and, and, and the product uh, uh, works the, the way it is supposed to work so that it is still uh, available and um, the last uh, important thing that is important once the feature is in production and we made sure there was no let's say uh, bad impact uh, for uh, the, the users it's um, the living documentation and the product analytics so here the idea is to gather data based on the usage of the, the new feature that was deployed in production. And for this, so we typically use um, uh, two things. The living documentation that Vincent uh, will uh, show you, and that is uh, uh, generated from the acceptance criteria that were defined using a, a business terminology. So these acceptance criteria, uh, this living documentation reflect the true behavior of the application in production because uh, uh, the acceptance tests have been uh, executed as part of the continuous integration continuous deployment pipeline unlike any other word document or a wiki that uh, you may try to keep up to date with your application here we are sure it's uh, always uh, up to date and the, the second um, uh, pillars of this approach is uh, using um, product analytics to see what's the usage uh, of the new feature, how does it impact the users? And the combination of both, the integration of both, uh, deliver a huge value. So we're gonna see that um, during the last part of the demo. Yeah, I can share the screen, that's better. Uh, yeah, so the living documentation uh, can be found here in the test and uh, it's generated from uh, a test run. So this way, uh, every time you update uh, the test run link to the CI, so shadowy, that means that you've developed a new feature, this documentation will be updated. Uh, the living documentation, one thing that is important, you should see that as your knowledge base, uh, knowledge base uh, on your product. And uh, one important thing is that this uh, living documentation is really easy to share with anyone in the company. First, because it's using uh, uh, really uh, common business terminology and also because it's easy to have uh, really an overview of the different uh, examples. So here you can share uh, this documentation with anyone in the company. So not only the dev and QA team, uh, really the technical people, you can uh, share that with uh, anyone more uh, business people, like for example at sales or at marketing. Uh, as we mentioned before, uh, those uh, this documentation can be uh, completed with data gathered uh, on the production side. So here, for example, uh, I used Google Analytics to uh, 
<coughs> to track the usage of uh, the coffee machine. So it's a web coffee machine. It doesn't really make coffee, so there is not that much usage, sadly. Uh, but at least we get some uh, some ideas. So here, for example, uh, what we can see is that uh, on Saturday, I think it was Saturday, uh, there was uh, around 200 clicks on uh, the button to uh, get back some beans in the coffee machine. So this kind of data, you can uh, gather them from different tools. I use Google Analytics, but I could have used uh, Segment.io, Pendo, uh, Intercom, anything that helps complete uh, the data. Here we've got uh, in test, we've got the, we need the behavior data, and we can complete them with some more uh, uh, usage data. And that's really useful uh, when you want to really understand what the feature does and how it impacts uh the different users another thing for each of the feature we can have the history of it so once again that's a simple project uh there is not that long history on this one but here on a real project i could see that it's been deployed in production uh, let's say one month ago and there's been uh, three more example added uh, last month and so on you can really see the life cycle of uh, the feature one other use we can have with uh, the, the living documentation is a digest. So the idea of the digest is to see, okay, what has happened in the last two weeks of this project. So here uh, we know that those four different features uh, in this uh, project have been updated in the last two weeks. Specifically, how we use it here at tip test uh, at the end of an iteration. So we got uh, two weeks sprints. To, know, to really see, okay, what has been given to our users during those two weeks. And of course, you can add uh, this kind of that just for, let's say, uh, last quarter, if you want to uh, have a newsletter, for example, and remember everything that's been added to the tool. So, uh, yeah, so here it's really uh, where you're going to uh, gather all the data and discuss with anyone in the company. So thank you, uh, Vincent. That's the that's the wrap up for uh, this part. So uh, we we first start, started by testing the ID and making sure the, the implementation works as expected. And now we've been able to uh, also gather some data and real feedback from the the production. Yeah. So it's time for us to uh, take the the last part. Uh, and iterate. So basically, gather all the data we've had from the, the three first steps and understand what we are going to do uh, with the product, or at least with the feature. And basically, we have three choices. First one, uh, uh, the feature is not that useful for uh, the real users. They don't use it. And in that case, the best thing to do is to remove it along with uh, the test because you don't want to spend time in the next month, next year, uh, to maintain the code and the test for something that no one uh, uses. It's a loss of time and well, you don't want to do that. Second case, uh, you start having some good feedbacks from your, from your users, but you have only uh, uh, made the first increment of the feature. So you have only three examples on the 10 example that is uh, implemented. It's time for the dev team to keep the good work and uh, add a second or third increment. Last case, uh, you've done everything. It doesn't have a bad impact on the server. People love it. So in that case, you just uh, validate the feature and well, you start working on a new one because well, it never stops. Uh, one thing to, to note about uh, this validation part, uh, you need to remember that this is not uh, something that's done once. Uh, a feature can be validated today because it has lots of traction, it works really fine, but in uh, three or four months, maybe people will stop using it because there is another better feature somewhere else or things like that. And in that case, if you see that you lose uh, any usage of this specific feature, maybe it's time to think about removing it once again with the test. So uh, this is really a continuous uh, process that uh, takes place all along the life cycle of the product. So I think, Laurent, it's up to you to, to it's conclude. It's time for, for the wrap up before we start the, the Q&A session. So I hope that next time um, uh, someone will ask you uh, what's continuous testing, you'll be able to say that first it's about uh, collaboration. And we've seen our 
uh, how behavior driven development uh, foster team collaboration. So remember that the the same uh, scenarios that you've seen in IPTES written in a business readable way by, by the product owner, or it can be also a business user or tester, they've been consumed by um, the dev team as executable scripts. So that's uh, uh, one uh, important um, uh, pillar of uh, continuous testing. The second one is uh, test automation. And you've seen in action a hip test publisher together with uh, uh, cross-browser testing, so which complements greatly this, uh, this approach. So giving you the ability to automate and execute your uh, Selenium test at scale uh, in parallel in different uh, environments. And the third uh, pillow is learning. Continuous testing is about learning. So the shortest, the feedback loop is, uh, and the better it is. And, and for this, living documentation and, and integration with uh, product analytics is definitely a, a great way to, to have a, a better insight about how um, the users and users consume your, your product. So these are the, the three benefits of continuous testing. The first one is giving you the ability to uh, uh, have a, um, a test first, a test value first uh, approach, and then progressively invest in, uh, uh, in the quality of the feature and the coverage. So you can uh, progressively add more, let's say, unit tests or increase the coverage of a feature uh, once you make sure that this feature is being used and uh, really have a great impact uh, on, the, on the users. Uh, and, and the last point is about um, experimentation. When you have such uh, testing framework in place uh, in your DevOps team, you uh, make sure that um, all the team, either the, the ID, the suggestions of the feature comes from the users, uh, the product guys, the developers, the testers. Uh, okay, let, let's do it. Let's try a first increment. Uh, let's see, uh, based on data, what's the impact on, on users? And we'll see if it makes sense to, to continue. So that's really a context suitable to uh, experiment. The last uh, thing I, I we will let you with is uh, remember, just keep in mind that the biggest risk when uh, you start a new product or you start to work on a new feature uh, is to make something that uh, nobody uh, wants. So that, that's the value of uh, this continuous testing approach uh, from ID to, uh, to production, providing you with a very quick uh, feedback loop. So that's it for um, what we wanted to share with you. Um, it's time now to uh, answer the, the questions. And we already have uh, two of them. So uh, the first one uh, related to uh, uh, recorded. The record, so yes, the, this session was recorded. And you will receive an email by tomorrow with um, a uh, link to the, the recorded session. So you'll be able to uh, uh, see it again and share it with, uh, with your team. Uh, by the way, uh, in the follow-up email, you will have also the link to the, uh, to the presentation. So you will have the, the PDF uh, presentation. And Vince, Vincent, during the demo, mentioned um, two other webinars. So uh, next week, we'll have uh, one webinar really dedicated to behavior-driven development and another one dedicated to uh, test automation. So we'll also, in this follow-up email, share with you uh, the, the link if you want to register to these two uh, webinars. So uh, we have uh, uh, two other questions. Uh, one from uh, Sankari. Is there any documentation? for uh, writing uh, automated tests. So Vincent? Uh, yeah, um, yeah, we got some uh, documentation on the IP test site uh, explaining how uh, you can yeah, automate the test uh, with an init test. And uh, one thing I can just uh, get back there. Uh, if you regenerate the, the coffee machine project, uh, you'll have two links uh, with tutorials so how you can, uh, yeah, write BDD scenarios from uh, this coffee machine project and another one on how to integrate with a CI tool. Uh, most of the, the code is already written, but uh, that will help you uh, really understand how uh, uh, the automation part uh, is done. So we have many resources to help you step by step with that. Uh, yeah, one and, and we'll be very soon posting uh, some uh, source code and, and blog articles and recorded video 
on how to use hip test in combination with other smart bear uh, test automation products uh, so just cross browser testing test left and so on uh, next one is do you support data driven testing uh, data par parameterization <laughs> i hate this word uh, yes i can have an i have an example here it's uh, even the example uh, ryan was using here for example we got uh, one scenario uh, which is driven by a data table so in my example there is not the, the german example but here you can have uh, one scenario uh, using different data sets uh, yeah, to, to run it with a different value and uh, get different uh, potential outputs. And typically in real life project, we have data with uh, thousands of columns, so parameters and hundreds of lines. So it can, it can be very, uh, very big. Um, the questions related to the integration or connection with Hadoop. So for uh, these questions, typically, uh, Sankari, the, the support will uh, get back to you and uh, I suggest that we have a one-to-one -one, uh, conversation. Um, another question by Emmanuel is, is it kind of a live support given test? Um, so yeah, to be clear, when you um, start to use the platform, what you can see here is that you have a, a Hina chat and, and using this, you can get in touch with uh, the support team. So we can uh, help you step by step uh, with uh, the adoption of FIP test. We also have many, many uh, resources available uh, on, on our website. Uh, so in the blog, uh, uh, tutorials, as Vincent uh, mentioned. So a BDD tutorial, a tutorial for uh, test automation. Uh, uh, we also have a post available if you want to automate tests for uh, with Appium on mobile device and, and so on. So many, many resources. I strongly recommend you to uh, take a look at the so test.com website and uh, get started uh, section. So uh, his questions from uh, Lee Xavio, is there any uh, chance to categorize action word by feature? So here that's a uh, uh, test user, I think that's for you, Vincent. Yeah, uh, yeah. so uh, yeah, if, uh, if we can categorize the action word. Uh, currently, it's not possible. One thing we plan to do, uh, that's the occasion to show our public track backlog. Um, so uh, the Trello uh, Lauren mentioned uh, in our process is available for the users. Uh, it can be seen there and in there. I won't search in it, but uh, we plan to have the possibility to uh, sort action word in different folders. Uh, that said, one thing to note is uh, depending on the language uh, you use, you don't have to keep all the action word in one single file. Uh, we generate it this way by default because it's easier to get it working out of the box and each team will uh, want its own way to organize the scenarios, the, the action words. But it's possible uh, to make this organization yourself. And to give an example here at tip test, our action word are split in uh, various modules. Uh, the one uh, impacting the directly on the back end, the one really playing with uh, water, uh, it's an equivalent to selenium. And inside those ones, it also splits uh, following uh, the page object. So that's possible uh, to do that. Um, so we have uh, one question about cross-browser testing uh, if the product uh, consider mobile devices. So I think that's uh, one of the great strength of the product. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Cross-browser testing gives you access to, uh, you know, both desktop configurations, Windows and Mac OS, as well as uh, mobile devices, uh, uh, you know, mobile phones, tablets. So you can test your web application from browsers across all those uh, all those devices. So we have uh, another question, which is more uh, process related uh, from Richard, who takes ownership and responsibility for continuous testing. Uh, so that's uh, indeed a, a great question. And of course, that depends on the uh, maturity of your team. Uh, uh, at what I, I can say that if we share our own, uh, uh, own uh, example, a tip test, uh, this is uh, the, um, the product because we, we the, so the product organization, myself as product leader, because we it's not um, just about unit testing or uh, test automation as I 
It's about uh, testing continuously from ID to production and making sure that we develop the right thing, not just developing the thing right. So um, that's, of course, uh, related to the, the business value and, and the, the impact that we want to uh, have on the end user side. So that, that's the responsibility, definitely, of uh, in our organization of the management and the, on the product side. So the, for the rest, the way we manage QA and testing, uh, we have different feature teams. And testing is the responsibility of the team. It's not the responsibility of uh, the, the quality of the product is the responsibility of the team, not the responsibility of uh, one tester or one one role. Uh, every everyone, including Vincent, uh, uh, have to take care about uh, the quality of the code he develops. And sometimes Vincent is developer. Sometimes he's also being a tester. Uh, for uh, uh, another uh, feature he has not worked on. So um, that, that's the way we've seen many um, feature teams or DevOps teams uh, works with this uh, uh, shared ownership of, uh, of the quality. But that's a, that's a long journey, uh, moving from a, a dedicated uh, QA department or teams to having testers embedded uh, with uh, development teams and having this shared responsibility. You also need to have the right developers for, for that. So that's a long journey. And maybe that should require a dedicated uh, webinar. Um, maybe we can take uh, one last question. Uh, are there any plan to bring back the past and next button? OK, so, uh, so the answer is yes. I think it's a very specific questions related yeah. to uh, uh, historical uh, test user. So the answer is yes. For all the other questions, we've not been able to uh, answer because there are um, many of them yet uh, still to uh, that are open. We'll uh, make sure that uh, we will answer them uh, by email after this uh, webinar. So I think it's time to uh, say bye bye. I would like to uh, thank you very much for your time, for all your questions. Uh, that's a very exciting and uh, innovative topic. And um, at the end of this webinar, you will we've done we're doing a quick survey, so we will be asked uh, four quick questions. It just take a couple of seconds to answer. So we would really appreciate if you could take times to uh, answer those questions. That will help us to improve our webinars in the future. And if there is any topic that you would have seen uh, covered in this webinar and and, and that wasn't so some, uh, let's say, new topic for uh, future webinars, just let us know. We'll be uh, happy to address that in the future. Thanks again very much. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Thank you.